In the previous videos, we have designed a vending machine controller that accepts nickels, dimes, and quarters. We are going to add one seemingly small feature to this design, which has significant ramifications. The ability to accept pennies. This will be our starting circuit, which we named Model C in earlier videos. Note that Model D included the feature of remembering change, but we won't have that feature here. Now, pause and consider. By accepting pennies, how will the circuit need to be adjusted? Pause the video as you contemplate. With sequential circuits, design questions usually begin with the memory. If we get the state memory set up, we can tailor next state logic and output logic to work with it. Previously, with the smallest coin and nickel, we could use state memory to represent increments of 5 cents. For example, 30 cents was encoded as 0110. That won't work with pennies. Now, each money amount must be represented directly in binary. So, 30 cents would be 11110. The obvious result is that a 4-bit register won't be large enough. Just counting to the original price of 40 cents requires 6 bits. So, a 6-bit register is the minimum. However, it would be nice to have more bits. This would prevent overflow issues and allow possible future increases in price. 8 bits is a convenient choice. We have already seen that 4-bit devices are common. We could maybe find an 8-bit device or tie two 4-bit devices together. Either way, with 8 bits, the largest money total possible is $2.55, which is a significant buffer over 40 cents. Since we will expand the register to 8 bits, all the other connected devices must be expanded as well. This means we'll need an 8-bit adder and an 8-bit comparator. Let's see how these devices will look in the next slides. First, the register. This is the easiest device to expand because all the bits work independently of each other. This 175 device simply holds four separate flip-flops, and those flip-flops don't interact directly with each other. This left image shows the previous design, with 4 bits. This right image shows the new design, with 8 bits. We just use two devices. They should both be connected to the same clock and clear signals. The input and output pins must be carefully named to make sure they feed into the correct adder and comparator ports. We will use the convention of most significant bit at the top, counting down to least significant bit at the bottom. Notice how I name these two devices to help indicate that. Now to expand the comparator. Again, we'll use two of the same 4-bit devices, but where do we go from there? Let's look at this input by input. Based on the past model, the register values should feed into the A ports. Therefore, Register bits 0 through 3 feed into the bottom A ports, and register bits 4 through 7 feed into the top A ports. Similarly, the price inputs should feed into the B ports. This must follow the same pattern of least significant 4 bits below and most significant 4 bits up top. One set of inputs remain, the tiebreakers. How do we handle these? We still want a VIN to be available if the register matches the price exactly, or if the user overpays. When in doubt, examine numerical examples. Let's say register and price hold the two 8-bit values shown here. Which is bigger? The answer is R, or register. Because its most significant 4 bits are larger, we don't even need to compare the least significant 4. Now for the second example. Which of these two numbers is bigger? The answer is P, or price. In this case, the most significant 4 bits are equivalent, so we must look at the least significant 4 bits. Here, P is larger, and so P is the larger number overall. 
Did you notice the approach? The most important values are the most significant four bits. Only if they are tied do we need to use the least significant four bits as the tiebreakers. This leads to connecting the comparator devices as shown. Note the bit values named next to each comparator. The final result will be this A greater than B line, leaving the more significant comparator. If register is greater than price up here, then vend is available. If there is a tie up here, then refer to the less significant comparator. Finally, if there is a tie down here, that means all eight bits are equivalent or that the user has input exact change. In that case, this final tiebreaker, provided by the plus five volt signal, says that VEND should be available. This is the same idea used in the previous model. One more device needs to be expanded, the adder. Again, we can double up on the four bit chips. This little black line is important. It shows that the carry out bit from the less significant adder becomes the carry in to the more significant adder, just like the cascading adders we saw months ago. As in the previous model, these B ports should be connected with the register values. Just be sure that R7 goes up top and R0 down below. The A ports are a little trickier. We could use a similar strategy as before, where we connect each coin input line to its appropriate bit weights. But a better strategy is to build a coin encoder device that does the work for us. This will use fewer visible wires, which is more important now with an extra coin type and with more bits. But a better reason is that the encoder device will be easier to test to ensure correct operation, as opposed to making a mistake on one individual wire and spending time troubleshooting. This idea of compartmentalizing into devices becomes more and more important as circuits get more complex, like the ones you'll work with in the future. This is where we'll stop this video. In the next one, we'll see how to design that coin encoder and tie it into a functioning vending machine controller with pennies.